So good. Hey, Stoss, uh, thank you for that. Uh, if you missed that song or if it's uh, relatively new to you, that's Lauren Daigle, Rescue. A great video, great song, and timely. You know, it's just a difficult season right now. Cases continue to surge, dear, and the unemployment rates is heavy on our hearts, mm -hmm. uh, even within our own immediate um, territory and, you know, people that are hurting that we're ministering to, reaching out to, and just want you to stay safe, everybody. Take it seriously and uh, all doing our part. So glad that you're tuning in for this. Uh, grateful that you're staying engaged mm -hmm. and in God's word and prayer and uh, communion. That was a great communion service yes. that we enjoyed together last weekend. Thanks for tuning in for that. If you missed it, it's online at uh, our YouTube channel or over at uh, horizon.org, uh, as well as all of our Galatians studies. Mm -hmm. And um, thanks for having me along. Thanks for being along. Well, we're just kind of figuring trapped out. Trapped here together. Yeah, we're trapped here <laughs> together. <laughs> and happy birthday. Thank you. You look amazing. <laughs> you don't look older. You look better. Okay. How you feel? Okay. <laughs> It's kind of surreal. It is. Didn't really feel like celebrating. Not really. We don't, at birthdays at our age anyway, but. Right. Especially in the, you know, sort of environment. It was just kind of hard to get the party on. <laughs> but. Um, it was sweet. Some positive news for you. Oh. Yeah. You know, we do all these church analytics, you know, and everything and sort of keep track. And um, although the offerings are. At an all-time low. It's a tough time. Um, you know what's huge? Home groups. Home groups. <laughs> <laughs> We've never had so, so many, many home that's... groups. Right. So, um, hey, we're trusting on. Amen? We are indeed. And Palm Sunday this next weekend, there's something to celebrate that our king rides in and sets his face towards uh, the cross and all that he's accomplished for us. You can't isolate that. You can't sequester that. Um, and we got the Katinas joining us for it. It's fun. Love those guys. A lot of fun. Always a blessing. Uh, blessing to have God's word in front of us. So why don't you turn to the book of Isaiah? <laughs> I know I always throw you a curve, but Isaiah chapter seven, if you would, please, while we jump into Galatians, just Throw your homework or pen or pencil into Galatians 5. We'll be right there in a moment. But uh, there's a little verse that uh, Isaiah uses that I think totally sets the table for our study today. And um, it's in Isaiah chapter 7, and it's not even a whole verse. It's verse 9. It's the second half of verse 9. He's, he's talking in verse 9 uh, to Ephraim and to Samaria, to the head of Samaria, and then at the end of that verse, he says the most amazing thing. Look what he says. And then I'll have you read Galatians 5 for us. Okay. Or at least the first part, the part we're studying. Okay. Um, if, uh, if is Isaiah 7, 9. You got it? Okay, look at, look at. If you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. Mm. What a nugget. Yeah. It's just like jumped off the page for me in terms of wrapping up uh, really what we've been looking at, you know. And now for four chapters in Galatians, it's kind of been the same song on repeat mm -hmm. over and over and over and over again. It must be important. And it must be important. And he's certainly getting to the importance of it here in chapter five. But there's a translation, uh, I think it's the message or one of the translations that takes that verse from Isaiah chapter seven, where he says, if you don't believe, and that's Paul's whole heart in this whole thing, if you're not gonna believe this, you're not gonna stand, man. And, and I just think that's so relevant and pertinent to where we are right now as families, as communities, as a nation, as a world. I mean, God's drawing us in. Mm -hmm. 
And if, if we don't believe, surely you will not be established. It's sort of like if you don't stand firm in your faith, you're not going to stand at all. Um, you won't, I think the message says, you won't have a leg to stand on. So uh, I thought that was just a great way to start our time together. So we're in Galatians 5, and sort of with that as the backdrop, would you read it for us? The first um, 15? 15 verses. Okay. Yes, dear. <clears throat> Galatians 5. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. You become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. You ran well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in you in the Lord that you will have no other mind but he who trouble you, troubles you shall bear his judgment, whoever he is. And I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why do I still suffer persecution? Then the offense of the cross has ceased. I could wish that those who trouble you would even cut themselves off. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the laws fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, beware, lest you be consumed by one another. Wow. So I know you've got some thoughts on that. Um, can I just circle back to chapter one before you share them? Yeah. Okay. Um, just go back, to, go back to chapter one. I think he's really pulling the full circle. And here in chapter five, going back to where he started. And this whole idea of you know, standing firm in the faith and uh, not losing sight of it is, is really how he starts. And I just want to remind you of how it started. He says in verse 6 of chapter 1, he says, I, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you who want to pervert the gospel of Christ. Uh, some translations uh, use the word distort, to distort the gospel. And that's what he is most concerned with as he now begins to sum up his letter in chapter five. That word distortion, it's an interesting word. Um, and it's only used three times in scripture. L let me show you. Um, turn to um, James chapter four. Look at James 4, verse 9, just a few, um, few books up to the right there if you're in Galatians, past Hebrews. Um, yeah, here's one of the only two other times, three total in Galatians, uh, in James chapter 4, uh, look at verse 9, lament and mourn and weep and let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. There's, that's the same word, distortion. It's, it's, it's making something to become what it's not meant to be. Mm. So laughter isn't meant to be mourning, right? Um, joy is not meant to be gloom. It's a distortion of, of the real essence of what joy is meant to be for joy to become gloom. It's a distortion for laughter to become the opposite, right? So what he's saying in Galatians is you're taking the faith and you're distorting it. You're turning it inside out. You're making the grace of God into something that it was never intended to be. Joy was never intended to be gloom, but it's it's distorted there as James is describing it. Let, let me show you the another, another, turn to Acts. Acts chapter two is the, is the other time that this word, the only times that it's used in scripture, I find it 
kind of fascinating. Here, here's another, here's, here's the only other example is Acts chapter two uh, in verse 20, where um, Peter's given this amazing sermon and he's, it's the day of Pentecost and he uses the same word, the word distortion again, when he says this in verse 20, that the sun will be turned into darkness. Mm. Or in other words, the sun will be distorted, distorted or perverted into what the sun was never intended to be. The sun goes dark, dark. And, um, and the moon into blood and, uh, and, and the coming and, awesome, and, and uh, awesome, awesome day of the Lord. So um, turn back to Galatians because that, that is fascinating to me, the intensity upon which Paul uses this word distortion. It's... it's, it's I was searching my library to try and come up with a, a book or an example that would sort of bring that home. <laughs> and you know what I found? I see. Curious George. In your library. In my library, yes. It's Bo's library. It's Bo's library, it is. But um, I grew up on it, you grew up on it. Didn't we all grow up on Curious George? We love Curious George. And, and one of the books we love the most is when Curious George goes to the circus. Right? Try and find that one on eBay, because in its first edition, <laughs> um, so what's my point? My point is uh, <laughs> you go to the circus and you see all these strange contortionists, okay. right? Mm -hmm. uh, or you go like to the Del Mar Fair and you go into the House of Mirrors and it's just sort of like... Distorted. Distorted. It's like, you know, and it's bending and it's twisting and it's totally unnatural. Mm -hmm. Um. Here's another thing out of Bo, out of Bo's collection. <laughs> do you know this guy? I do. Yeah, you grew up on him, didn't you? My brothers did. Stretch Armstrong. Okay, grab him. Grab him. Grab grab him with me. Okay. Grab him. Yeah, that's not right. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Uh, you're like totally concerned that maybe yeah. Armstrong had more pants when, when I was young. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's exactly what Paul's afraid of right there in Galatians. They're stretching the gospel. They're distorting the gospel. They're turning the gospel into something it was never meant to be. They're perverting it. Get some pants on, Stretch. <laughs> um, it's, it's the apostle Paul goes to the circus is, is what Galatians is all about. And he's dealing with these spiritual contortionists. And, and he's pretty furious about it because they're distorting the very truth and heart and nature of what the gospel represents, like taking the sun and turning out its, its, its light. It's, it's, it's like, ah! And so um, it's, it's Paul's heart to differentiate between a distinct gospel of, of, of what it truly is at the core and what has now become a distorted gospel. Share some thoughts on, on what the Lord has shown you from this passage, at least maybe from the first half of it. Okay, well, I think this, this week's lesson was called The War Within, and I know, and this is what Paul is reiterating to them, you're saved by grace. There's nothing that anyone can do that I can do to earn my salvation. Ephesians 2, I said um, the first week of this study um, that I sum up Galatians personally in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Right. And that's just the, the purity of the gospel. There's nothing I can do. Um, but I do struggle with this war within. Um, I struggle between the flesh and the spirit. And having been saved, I'm now supposed to walk in the spirit, right? Um, but I struggle with that. I struggle with, gosh, I feel daily, I don't pray enough, I don't read the word enough, I don't love enough, I don't give enough, I don't have enough faith over fear, that's my struggle. Um, in this, the circumstances we find the world in right now is hang, hanging on to faith over fear and and I struggle with all of that. And, and I can't encourage you enough, if you struggle with any of that, um, that battle within the flesh and the spirit, 
to read Romans 8. Homework had us read Romans 7, and I encourage you to read Romans 8. Um, just verse 1, I'll share with you. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. There's no condemnations when you walk according to the Spirit and not according to the flesh. You really can't read Romans 7. Without reading Romans 8. Right. Keep reading. Yes, please. Keep reading. <laughs> um, but how do I do that? How do I walk in the Spirit? And, and next week is walking in the Spirit. But I was thinking about this um, and looking forward to next week. Um, but I was thinking, how is it I walk in the Spirit? Well, um, First of all, I ask in faith, and, and I find myself praying all the time, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. I ask in faith, Lord, I want to walk in the Spirit. Then you read the directions, and you put it into practice. And I was thinking about that because the other day I had a piece of um, IKEA furniture in the garage, unopened, unbuilt. And I was wanting to organize. We've been accumulating some things for Bo and James, to play with. Stretch. Well, I don't know about that, but um, other toys. And I wanted to organize them, and I had this cubby hole thing in the garage that I hadn't put together yet. So I thought, well, now's a good time. So I did what I, I think it's a good illustration of what we do with our faith. I took a look at what do I have? You know, what gifts do I have? What has God blessed me with? Um, I open up the instructions. Yep. And I start trying to follow them and trying this, trying that. Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. Um, and that's really what we do with our faith. We open up the instructions and we start reading them and applying it. And when I get stuck and I couldn't figure out what to do, hey, Mitch, who happened to be here, <laughs> uh, someone who knew more about reading the directions and understanding them that came alongside me and helped me uh, put that thing together and made it work. And I just uh, keep thinking, you know, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, Christ lives in me. Um, and the life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so I ask in faith, I read the directions, I put it into practice, I ask for help, and that helps me in that war within between the spirit and the flesh. Yeah, I think that's great. And it came together. It's awesome. You know, it's awesome. And your toy corner is amazing. It's cute. It's cute. It looks really good. And there were like 7 billion pieces in the box when you opened it up. It's like, how do you even begin with this IKEA deal? And and, and one, one step at a time. One step at a time. Um, the difference is where Paul is writing to Galatians, he's saying there's one piece in the gospel box. You keep adding a bunch of pieces into into the box. There's one piece. It's mm. Christ. And as as much as I completely agree that when you need the summation of what Paul is discussing, just sort of set before you again, you you, you want to go to Romans chapter eight. You want to be able to say there is therefore now no condemnation in those who are in Christ Jesus, and that's got to be bookend with. Ephesians chapter 2, that you've been saved by grace. That's what God's put in the box. He's put salvation in the box You're Saved by, by faith in Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ alone. A third place that you could turn to just to be assured of the power of what Christ has done, because as chapter 5 begins, what, what does he say? He's talking about freedom. He's he, That Christ has... For freedom's sake, Christ has made you free. And, and I think that third place would be 1 Corinthians 15. Turn there with me real quick. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Or I can just read it to you. You'll be reminded of it. It's the amazing summation that he would then give to the church at Corinth. In 1 Corinthians 15, he says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel. So you want to know what it is? Here it is. Which I preached to you, which you also received, in which you stand. Remember, I mean, that goes all the way back to Isaiah chapter 7. you got to stand on this or you're not going to have a leg to stand on. And he says, here it is, verse 2, by which you're also saved if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. 
For I deliver to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day, according to the scriptures, that he was seen by Cephas, that's another word for Peter, and that he was seen by the 12, and he was seen by over 500, and uh, of, of whom the greater remain to this day. Some have fallen asleep. He's like, some have died, but some you can go and ask them yourself. This is straight up gospel truth. This is it. And then, he's, and then he's like, he was seen by James and he was seen by the apostles. And last of all, he was seen by me. So he's referring back to his day of conversion um, on the road to Damascus. And he's saying the gospel impacted my life personally and radically. And, and he's just so much wanting to say, it is the only hope that you have for true freedom. Because, because, because religion's going to strap you down and, and hold you back and bind you up. And anything that you, you know, want to sort of like self-invent as, as being your cure or your hope or your answer or how you're going to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, which is the most ridiculous saying in the world. Has anyone ever tried that? Try and pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. <laughs> you don't get very far. He's like, this is where you get far. This is where you get to where you could never get to on your own. It's through the gospel. So, so let, me, let me give you some points in addition to the homework, just to sort of meditate on, maybe marinate in, maybe just mull over where the gospel is concerned because he's really wanting to differentiate between a false gospel in Galatians chapter five and the true gospel meaning boiled down guts of the gospel. And, and, and I would just sum it up this way. Listen, if, it's not, if the gospel isn't scriptural, if you want sort of like your pH test, you know, as to whether or not your gospel is valid, you know, I have this pH test I put in the spa, in the, in the, in the hot tub. Mm -hmm. You have a pH to put in, the, in your pool, if you have a pool, Okay, here's your pH test, whether or not your gospel is valid, whether it's a true thing. Here it is. If, it's, if it isn't scriptural, then it's not actual. If it isn't scriptural, if it isn't scripturally established and based, then your gospel is not sound. Okay, let's agree on that. Secondly, if it isn't built on the historical, authentic event that Paul is referring to here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, then it's a fake gospel. It's been distorted and perverted into something that it was never meant to be. It's curious George going to the circus. It's contortionists. If it isn't built historically on the authentic event that we are excited in about a week and a half to celebrate, mm -hmm. it's got to be based on that. Thirdly, uh, if it is, if your gospel isn't pointing to the accomplished objective of what Christ did for us on the cross, forgiving us of our sins, of what He did for us on the cross, then 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 your gospel's distorted and diluted. It's become a mixed drink. It's been watered down. If it isn't pointing to the accomplished work of Him being able to say, "It is finished." finished. Fourthly, if it isn't free, I mean freely available to us through faith, then it's, it's not of God because God gave his only begotten son. For God so loved the whole world that he gave his son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. That's it, you guys. And if anyone wants to add to that, well, it even says in the book of Revelation, then may the the punishments and the plagues of this book be added to that person. So if it isn't free, if it isn't freely available by grace through faith, then it's not of God. And then lastly, um, if it doesn't by itself atone for and attest and guarantee our forever destiny with God through Jesus Christ, then it's a forgery then it's a forged gospel. And that is truly Paul's concern in Galatians chapter five. I mean, right out of the gate, what does he say here? He says, 
um, in verse one, Galatians five, verse one, he says, stand fast. And again, I just bring you back to that verse in, in Isaiah. If you don't stand in this, you're not gonna have anything to stand on. Stand, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. And don't be entangled again in a yoke of bondage. That's, that's, that's Paul's heart, because that's God's heart for everyone listening. And, and I think he's super serious about it. He wants us to take heed, because anything short of that is short. You come up short. It's short of what the gospel really is. And if you come up short in what the gospel really is, then what you're counting in doesn't count. What you're counting in doesn't count. And that's what he means when he says, just a little bit of leaven. Mm -hmm. Just a li little bit off, right? Just a, a few degrees off. Fix the whole thing. Yeah. Um, leavens the entire lump. Just a little tiny amount ends up causing a cataclysmic shift and change. And um, because it's been devalued. What should have counted for them in, in the region of Galatia as counting for everything has been reduced. It's been devalued. It's been diluted. It's been distorted. It's been stretched into something that that the Lord never meant for it to be. And Paul's like, ah! And, and I think the big concern is what was happening back then could very well indeed be happening today. And that's, that's why this study through Galatians is so intense. That's why it's so important. That's why we take it so much to heart, lest we also end up veering off the path and sort of leaving the gospel road. There's just one road that leads to heaven, and it's yep. it's the gospel. What else did the Lord put on your heart where this passage is concerned? Because I know he did. It's like all about love, just how we're love. really to live this out in, in, in the power and in the authority of... When you really believe the gospel, when it becomes real to you, that, that you're completely free... It's a free gift. Eternity is secure. How can you not respond to that? Right. You just, it's, it would be impossible if you truly accept that in faith and you know that Christ died for you to take away all of your sin so that you can live in a perfect eternity with him. Everything that he promises us um, you know, in a time of such struggle in the world to know what we have to look forward to, that this is temporary, how do we not respond to that? How do we not share that? And in the second half of this um, section of Scripture, it talks about love fulfilling the law. And um, we're not bound by the law, but our response to what God has done for us is, is to offer what He has offered us, and that's love. And and what is the greatest way to love? And I've just been thinking about that a lot as we're, as we're confined <laughs> to our homes. Um, what do people need the most right now? And they need Jesus. They need Jesus and everything that knowing Jesus brings. And for so many years now as a church, we've been um, people, but we've been people who meet in a place, right? I mean, pointing Jesus people to Jesus, teaching them about Jesus. It's why we exist. Um, a place to come and learn about him, to worship him, to serve him, um, to gather in his name. But now here we are in our living room and you're in, maybe you're, you know, being wild today and you're out in your yard. <laughs> wow, that's wild. Um, but, on your balcony. Yeah. That's a vacation spot. Um, Kitchen table. But we're all as the body of Christ, we're separated in a way we're not used to being separated. And I've just been thinking, you know, people are looking for hope. People are looking for an answer. They're looking for a way out. They're looking for freedom. And we know that that's found in Christ. And um, a month ago, you could have invited them to church. You could have said, hey, come to, on Easter. Um, and now we're in a place where we are, are not able to do that. We're, we're in our homes. So what can we do? And I believe that right now God has the world's attention. People are wondering. 
um, they're looking and and we need to act now I think is the time to act and so I was thinking how can we act when we're apart from everyone and I thought well we can act by thinking who we know in our lives who we have a connection with whose contact information do we have in our phone um, whose email do we have that we know needs Jesus and we need to step out and be bold um, make a list these are the people I know that I have been praying for that I think about that need to know the Lord and I'm gonna reach out I'm gonna call them whatever means I have I'm gonna text them I'm gonna zoom them mm. I'm gonna FaceTime which is not my favorite um, but um, to be bold in that to share the love of Jesus in this time in a way that maybe we never have before um, because I believe time is short and I believe God has the world's attention and now is the time to act. And, and we still offer what we can online, um, but there isn't a place to invite people to, so it's relationship. And we are the church, you are the church. And so in order to love the way that I believe God calls us to love, uh, we need to share this pure gospel more than ever before. Amen. We really do. You know, it's how the church began. This is entirely right now an experience that you and I are in the midst of that would be most comparable hmm. to how the church began. There was a time in the book of Acts where they couldn't come together and, and attend church as a community in Jerusalem. And that doesn't mean they shut it down. It means they scattered. They dispersed. They dispersed. It's the dispersion of what then took the gospel to the ends of the earth. And you guys, that's... We are the church. We are the church, and we are the church living at the end of the age, still with the Great Commission to take it at the end of the age to the ends of the earth. For us right now, that might be the end of our driveway. Right. And yet... Across the street. There could be needs right there where eternity is concerned, where God would want to use us to share his love and to step out in the gospel, in the power of what Christ has done and accomplished that sets us free and share that freedom with the neighbor. Like you said, share that freedom with your contact list. And let them reach out to God because God certainly is reaching out to us right now. I remember when Annie was young, when Anne was really, really little, she would she'd hold up her arms and she'd say, hold you, Daddy. Mm -hmm. And I never wanted her to change that. Yeah, I just, hold you, Daddy, hold you, Daddy. And um, I would pick her up and, and I would hug her and I would hold her and she'd say, hold you, Daddy. Well, Mitch was older and, you know, Mitch was tough and bulky and strong and, and he would say, I... I can hold you, Daddy. You know, he would think he could he he could hold me. He can now. And I would be like, oh yeah, little guy, you wanna you, you, you know? And so I'd put Annie down, and he'd be like, Hold you, Daddy, hold you, Daddy. And Mitch would be like, I can hold you. I'm big enough, I'm strong enough. And I would be careful, but I'd begin to sort of, you know, put my full daddy weight on him. Like no contest, right? Right. He has a little bit of your claustrophobia. Because, <laughs> you know, you begin to put that weight on, and all of a sudden, if I were to put, I'm big, I'm, I'm so much big, I would, cr I would end up, not now, like you said, not now, not now, but he could take me, but then I would crush him. Mm. Is that not exactly what Paul is saying in this passage? That if, if, if you think, you can come to God who just wants to hold you. If you think you can come to him in your own religion, in your own law, in, in your own devices, in your own ingredients, in your own recipe, a works-based religion, which is what they're all about in Galatia, it will crush you. It will, it's too much, it's too much to bear. And what, what Paul is saying is there's a much better way. Just be free of that weight and of that entanglement and of that heavy burden, you know, of it all. And, um, 
It's got to be out of love. Mm -hmm. It can't be out of religion. It can't be out of a requirement. It's just, it's got to be out of love. If it's out of religion, Paul's saying it's, it's, it's empty. It's lifeless. And it's going to ultimately end up producing no change. No change whatsoever. That's kind of the fascinating thing about old Stretch Armstrong, right? That as much as you distort him and, and stretch him and wrap his... Oh, yeah, it's not right. You wrap, he ultimately, if you give him... Time. Time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He always reverts back. Religion is just going to revert back to where it started, which is a, a dead end. Not changing. And and I think a lot of us also, if it isn't religion that begins to bind us up, it's performance. That our identity, like you were saying earlier, is wrapped up more in the performance. I don't pray enough. I don't read enough. I don't serve enough. I don't do this enough. And that leads to fear and rejection mm -hmm. and everything that's the opposite of freedom. And yet he has come to set us free. And whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Well, that's a lot for us to certainly consider as we go to our homework, as maybe we zoom in with our groups, mm -hmm. and as we just share some thoughts of what God's shown us in this time of study through Galatians chapter five. But I would pray, what was the title of the chapter? The War Within. That the war would be won, mm -hmm. and you would just let the Lord wrap his everlasting arms of love around you, that, that your heart would be what Annie's heart was. Hold you, Daddy. Because he wants to hold you. He wants to love you. He wants to save you. He wants to forgive you. He wants to set you free. And whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Amen? Amen. Would you pray? Let's close. Lord, we just thank you for the freedom that is found in you and that uh, you just want to hold us and your love um, is so great that you gave your Son. And Lord, I pray that that pure gospel would be something that we don't take for granted, that we don't uh, lose sight of, that the joy and the peace and the hope that are found in the pure gospel of your Son and what he has done and accomplished for us on the cross and by rising again and defeating death would overflow into our lives, that his Spirit would take over and that we would just rest in that, Lord. Um, that we would walk in his spirit um, by faith and allow the overflow of your work to be what transforms our lives. We just thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So uh, say goodbye, Stretch. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Let's all say goodbye to stretching the gospel into something that it was never meant to be. Amen. In Jesus' name. Love you guys. God bless.